All right. Well, welcome everybody, and thanks for coming to join us. Um, you know, we've started up again with our webinar series. We've been doing these quite regularly for a while, and uh, kind of took a little bit of a break, hiatus work, just with getting busy and lots of things to do. But we're back at it, so there's gonna be a regular kind of bi-weekly thing. Um, so obviously, if you're here, you're probably in our database already, and so you'll be getting reminders of these. Um, as I go through, I certainly try to watch the chat and things like that, but I want to take a minute here just to, uh, if you, I'm fine if you interrupt me while I'm speaking. If you prefer to do it in chat, you can throw it in the everyone chat or send a message to either the Jessica Ward or Scott Glenza. Maybe Jess, Scott, I'm just going to let you guys introduce yourselves a bit here. So. Yeah, hey, I'm uh, Scott Glenza. I'm the sales rep here with Insight. Been here for just about two years now. So um, thank you guys all for, for joining and sit back and enjoy. I'm an instrumentation technician. I've been working with Insight for about a year and kind of do all sorts here doing service work. All righty. So, um, so we're going to talk today a little bit about um, dew point analysis. Uh, both water and hydrocarbon dew points, and specifically about the analyzer that's manufactured by Zgas Instruments out of uh, Maryland in the USA. And uh, we're kind of going to talk about this from the perspective of a little bit about first about who Inside Analytical is, and then talk about dew points, what they are, why we want to measure them, and then what's the unique technology that ZGAS brings to this to enable us to measure both water and hydrocarbon dew points in a gas phase stream. I mean, commonly we think about doing this in natural gas, but with CO2 sequestration becoming bigger again, and people looking at doing compression and re-injecting CO2, again, when as soon as you're doing compression, one of the things we're going to talk about is when we pressurize gas, we risk hitting a dew point. And so uh, water content when we're doing acid gas reinjections or CO2 sequestration is another important thing as well, along with uh, gas turbines, a hydrocarbon dew point is important. So a bunch of reasons for why we mentioned measure dew point. We'll talk about that a little bit. You know, we'll talk about the technology and how the analysis kind of works. A little bit about Insight. Uh, we are a Calgary-based systems integrator and distributor. Uh, we operate on Northeast Calgary. We have about 20,000 square feet of uh, manufacturing warehouse and office space, nine bay doors, 10 ton overhead crane. We can pull an uh, analyzer shelter right off the back of a flatbed and straight into the building. Um, we're in AB83, so for the Albertans or for the Canadians here, um, CRN numbers is a big deal. Uh, Canadian registration numbers for pressure uh, containing equipment. And so we're an AB83 AB compliant fabricator. So that means that everything we put out of the shop can have a CRN number on. We've done projects for Alberta, BC, Ontario, Saskatchewan, uh, CRNs. A lot of the folks that are with me here, uh, I've worked with in the past, especially from the Western Research Amatech days. And so we brought a lot of skills over with, with these people. Um, we've got a fantastic documentation team, great design and drafting resources do a lot of work with the big engineering companies. So we'll do that full, you know, all those big painful vendor documentation requirements. We're fine with doing all those and we've done a lot of them. Journeyman electricians on staff, full of factory acceptance tests uh, right here at our facilities. We will do systems integration for just about anything. Um, as far as if it's analytical, we like to work on it. Grab sampling panels, custom sample systems, process analyzer integrations, PLC and automation to full analyzer buildings. Um, we all work on those projects right from the front end engineering design stages uh, through to detail engineering, through to fabrication and you know, assembly. Again, you know, we'll do commissioning out in the field. And the big thing for us is customer service. So we run service teams out of Grand Prairie, out of Edmonton, out of Calgary, and we any product that we sell, you know, COVID has made this a little bit more difficult, but we try to get our service team down to the original equipment manufacturer, get them factory trained so we can service everything from up here. 
Some of you, if you know me, I know, I, or I also teach a course on analyzer sample systems. So one of the things we pride ourselves and we are, you know, I believe we're exceptionally good at it is we know sample systems really well. And so we make sure that we do the right things in your analyzer sample systems and in fact, teach other people how to do them. So the first thing we want to talk a bit about is what is dew point? You know, what do we mean? We hear this phrase all the time uh, about dew point analyzers. And so dew point is the temperature at which a component in a gas phase stream will change phase and become liquid. So, you know, we commonly see it here, right? Dew on the grass at night was because the air was humid. It got cool overnight, and as it cooled down, water condensed out on those blades of grass. Um, when we're going to hit a dew point, dependent is, is going to be dependent on the pressure of the gas. It's going to depend on the nature of the gas, what kind of kind of gas phase materials are there, and it's going to be a completely different thing if we're a single component or a multi-component gas. So, if the gas was pure propane. Well, then we cool it down. When we hit the dew point, all of that propane is going to try to condense out. But if it's natural gas with a bit of propane in it, when we cool it, the methane and the ethane in the natural gas and the CO2 will stay in the gas phase, but the propane may start to condense out. In the natural gas processing industry, both the water dew point and the hydrocarbon dew point are important. And so, you, there's a lot of techniques that we can go out and usually try to measure water vapor concentration and try to calculate a dew point from there. But if we want to get the actual dew point, the Bureau of Mines method, the standard method for uh, assessing what dew point is, is to cool an object down and see when things condense. And so in natural gas, we'd like to be able to do that both for water and for hydrocarbon dew points. If we're going to talk about dew points, it's good to have a little bit of an understanding, at least, of what a phase diagram looks like. And uh, what we're showing on the left over here, it, on the right, or the other left, um, is, is a phase diagram for water, for pure water on the, on the top one, at least. And so what phase diagrams tell us is things like, well, if we're at high temperatures and some moderate pressure, we might be over here and everything is a gas on this side. If we were to cool this and cool it down over to here, soon as we cross this boundary on the phase envelope, it says that it's going to start to condense out and become a liquid. And in fact, I kind of put my dot not in the most optimum place. I'll put another dot here. If we had started here and if we increase the pressure, it says if we increase the pressure enough, it'll also start to condense out as a liquid. So this gives us an idea, you know, in the first or in the previous slide, I'd said, it's important we understand the pressures that the systems are at and the temperatures, because both of those are going to affect when we're going to hit a dew point. So phase diagrams give us a lot of useful information. Chemical engineers use this a lot when they're looking at designing a plant. We're trying to figure out what pressures and temperatures are going to operate separators, fractionation uh, towers at, because Understanding the pressures and temperatures lets them know, I want a gas phase stream over here, liquid phase stream over here. So it lets them figure out what temperatures and pressures to run those vessels at. Gives us a lot of information. Oh, there's a Mr. Greg Philippot. Um, it gives us a lot of information about the phase behavior of the material and lets us understand, you know, under what conditions am I gonna hit condensation? Again, these are phase diagrams for what pure species look like. So in this case, this is pure H2O. When we get into more complicated streams where there's a lot of different chemical components, things like natural gas, when we get into those more complicated streams, we often talk about a thing called a phase envelope. And so the phase envelope for the hydrocarbon part refers to this curve that you see right here. And the phase envelope is 
informative for us because it lets us know, again, for this particular natural gas stream, if we were out here at some elevated temperature, it says it's all going to be gas on this side. As we cool the stream down and it crosses this phase envelope, that says, well, that's the first place that liquids are going to come out. And those liquids in this case will be hydrocarbons. So this would be our hydrocarbon dew point. So as we cool that gas down, we touch that phase envelope. Just like dew forming on the grass, as it cools, all of a sudden liquids show up there. And it says, if when we look at this, the other piece that's on this, uh, this graph is the water dew point as well. So this is the water curve right here. So in the particular stream or in the particular case we were looking at there, said, well, if we started over here and we cooled it down, when we hit this temperature here, which was maybe what, 40 F, when we hit that point, we were our first condensation of, of hydrocarbons. If we continued to cool it down and got to this point, water would start to condense out. So we can use this effect to figure out what's the, what's the hydrocarbon dew point and the water dew point of the stream. We just need to cool it down and in some way be able to detect that liquid has started to drop out and identify which liquid it is. The more complex, the, the more heavier hydrocarbons are in the stream, the further it goes away from being, say, a pure methane or an ethane methane stream, the fatter this phase envelope may get. So when we're trying to work at it from the liquid side, we often worry about, well, if I have a liquid sample over here, sorry, my school teachers didn't like my printing either. Um, if we started a liquid sample over here and we were to heat it up, well, we would hit what we refer to as on this side of the curve, we would hit the bubble point. It's a place where the first bit of gas starts to show up. So again, this is why this, these phase diagrams are really important to chemical engineers. When they're looking at a plant, they're saying, well, I want my natural gas liquids to stay liquid, so I'm gonna stay on this part of the phase diagram, and I want my natural gas to be all gas phase, so I'm gonna stay on the other part of the phase diagram. So there's two dew points we're interested in, hydrocarbon dew points and water dew points. Oops, there we go. Water dew points are really important to us. This is the temperature at which the first drop of liquid water can show up. And in a natural gas pipeline or in a compression situation, this can be really important because there's a risk of forming hydrates. So water and hydrocarbons well, there's my friend Nayef. Greetings, Nayef. Thanks for coming all the way from Saudi. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, water dew points are really important to us because when water condenses out, if there's hydrocarbons there, there's a risk of forming hydrates. There's this ice-like material that is, you know, you'll hear it ref referred to as a clathrate or a methane hydrate, a gas hydrate you can take an entire pipeline and start to block it off with basically this methane and water ice that forms up in the pipeline. So there's a number of other risks associated with uh, hitting water dew points. We'll talk about those as well. It's an important quality specification on our natural gas. And we, we see it get enforced either as dew point or as water concentration. And so one of the important things to realize when we talk about the Z-gas device is it is an actual true measurement of the water dew point, And from that, we can calculate the water concentration. Um, it, it is an actual dew point of the gas. And the, the important thing about that is, the really important, although it gets enforced sometimes as concentration, the really important thing to know in your processing facility is, where's my dew point temperature? because that's when I risk making liquids and that's when I start to run into problems. Water condensation in pipelines or in compression systems can lead to corrosion. 
Uh, it becomes a natural place for things like H2S to dissolve and promote sulfur corrosion. So, you know, when you think about the, you hear about the NACE specifications, the National Association of Corrosion Engineers, it's all about water and H2S together, water H2S and saline, or saline and uh, it, it, solutions are even worse, but it's often related to those materials being present at the same time. Hydrocarbon dew points create other issues for us. Again, now so the hydrocarbon dew point is the temperature at which the first droplets of liquid hydrocarbons will drop up. And again, it depends a lot on pressure uh, and the composition, but especially the hydrocarbon dew point is determined to a large extent by the amount of heavy hydrocarbons that are in there. So, Love this age thing where you have to take your glasses off to do things, but so what this graph over here is showing us is that if we took LNG, liquefied natural gas, has almost no heavy hydrocarbons in it. And so the dew point for that natural gas is likely going to be very low, in this case around minus 70 F. When we move over to say pipeline natural gas at the same pressure, the dew point might be closer to zero F. And if we go to wellhead gas, where there's a lot more heavier hydrocarbons in there, at the same pressure, we might be at a dew point of 75 or 100 degrees F. And so the whole thing, important thing here is the hydrocarbon dew point is determined primarily by the existence of heavy hydrocarbons there. People will sometimes try to say, well, I've got a GC already. I can just calculate the dew point. Most natural gas GCs only go out to C6 or C9 hydrocarbons. And it's the heavier ones than that that are often leading to where our first dew point is. So if you try to calculate your hydrocarbon dew point from your chromatograph results, you will inevitably not predict the actual dew point. You'll make an assumption that there's not very much heavy there because the GC doesn't see them. And you'll predict a dew point temperature that is lower than your <laughs> which means you can potentially run into a hydrocarbon dew point issue. Again, it's an important quality specification on natural gas. Too much hydrocarbons, too much, the potential for liquid hydrocarbons can in a burner, whether it's a home furnace, whether it's a combustion unit, it can cause flashbacks, it can cause flame outs in burners, it can overheat gas turbines. And so there's a bunch of issues that potentially occur when we hit a hydro when we have too much heavy hydrocarbons in our system. And so the important specification then becomes this: uh, what is my hydrocarbon dew point? Gas transportation companies realize that managing hydro hydrocarbon dew points reduces a lot of their li liabilities and opens up other gas markets for their products, generates more operating revenue. If we manage those, um, if we manage our hydrocarbon dew points well, we can prevent uh, condensation in cold spots that happen, let's say under rivers and lakes and pipelines. And once it clicks there, now you're starting to block cross-sectional layer of the pipe, you have more pressure drop, and then as it starts to build up, you can suddenly push that whole slug of liquid through in, uh, in one big chunk, if you like, and cause a lot of problems upstream. Hey, Phil, a quick question. Yeah. Um, so talking about specifications here, if you're the, the buyer, you're the TC Energy, um, you could dictate a, a specification but you couldn't dictate the technology to measure that, could you? Like for towards the producer. That's right. And so you're kind like, how do they, how does TC Energy kind of protect themselves then from a, just a crappy way of doing dew point measurement? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, we end up in this situation that, you know, I have my gas plant over here my natural gas processing facility. And my pipeline over here. And at some place, there's 
it moves across out of the plant and into the pipeline, right? And so there's a custody transfer point that happens there. So the gas plant, if it wants to make sure it's operating well, is going to put an analyzer over here. And so to Dale's point, the, the pipeline operator gets to put a specification on it. It says, I don't want your hydrocarbon dew point any higher than uh, minus 15 degrees C. Well, the gas plant can put the, an analyzer that doesn't do it very well. The gas plant may say, well, I'm gonna put an analyzer in there. The question is, are they gonna use a technology that's gonna work well? And so if they're doing a biogas chromatograph, as I said, they may not actually get an accurate number. And so on the pipeline side, they'll often first start out by taking a composite sample. So they'll, they'll take manual samples if you like. So someone like TC Energy will say, I'm gonna look at the quality of the product that comes out of this plant on a monthly average at least, and put a composite sampler out there. And if they, so they manually sample here, didn't leave myself much room to write. They manually sample, and if they find the plant is off spec frequently, then the TC may decide they will put their own analyzer over here, or they'll go to a plant and say, you guys are gonna look at your dew point analyzer and try to figure out whether either your technology doesn't work or it's been poorly implemented. But yeah, this is this interesting thing that comes up, this custody transfer piece. And you know, this is where, again, for facilities that are gonna put products into the pipeline, they're looking at it from the perspective of, if I am off spec, I run the risk of the pipeline company saying, we're gonna shut you in, not let you produce for our pipeline until you figure this out. But yeah, without, if, unless you're putting continuous analyzers in, um, all the way at those tie-in points at the pipeline, you're going to be in this position of having the risk that, well, the plant may just operate badly and put bad stuff into my pipeline. So what TC Energy does right now is they actually have um, several of these Z-gas analyzers mounted on a portable frame so they can go, I think we are having a problem at this plant over here. Let's go install it at our other plant. See if they've got issues. So there's a bunch of drivers around this whole idea of doing dew point determinations. From an operational perspective, hitting dew points can cause problems in other equipment, from a corrosion perspective, from reducing pipeline capacity, we'll have to pig the lines or clean out the pipes more often. The dew point also puts a lot of uncertainty in our flow measurements. And you gotta think when you're producing something like a, a gas that you're gonna sell to somebody, Dale's the producer, he's selling gas to me. If we don't measure the flow right, we don't know what volume he's sold to me. And it's, it's really becomes the cash register. So if I've created uncertainty in my flow measurements by having drops of liquid hydrocarbon in there or by having water in there, I can cause problems with how do I get my accounting done. From a safety perspective, those gas hydrates can plug off entire lines. They cause us processing issues. They clog the pipe. They give us reduced and restricted flow rates. So again, one of the costs when we're trying to move a gas through a pipe is compression. So if you restrict the pipe, you need more compression. Don't put more horsepower in, you're buying the power from someplace. The other thing is there's a lot of, you know, when we look at what's going on now, there's a lot of this shale gas that's been starting to be produced. And that shale, shale gas is often quite rich. It has a lot more heavy hydrocarbons in it. And so we've seen heavier gases getting processed from facilities. And so now all of a sudden these hydrocarbon dew points, especially issues may become more common. So you know, again, we got to realize the hydrate issue is a water thing. The heavier gas, this is the hydrocarbon side of things. Um, we have tariffs or or uh, custody transfer sort of specifications. So pipeline companies refer to it as a tariff. We're going to have a number that you have to be under if you want to be allowed to put into our system, and so. Again, as we see people becoming more sophisticated, realizing what problems there can be with products, uh, there's 
changes those regulations and people will start to put tighter and tighter specifications on those things. And again, if we have liquids drop out, the heavy hydrocarbon, the hydrocarbon dew point, if those liquids that dropped out, they don't get included in our BTU calculations now. So again, if I'm buying product from Dale, I want to pay him on how much volume did you give me and what was the energy content in that volume? So if I don't measure the BTU right, I don't give him the right energy number and Dale doesn't get paid for some of the stuff that he's given me. So there's a number of different reasons why we want to make this measurement. So we want to think about why is it that we do hit dew points? Liquids form in our system during operation of the plant, during how we're doing compression, uh, compression. they'll happen in process lines, or they can, the liquids can drop out in our system during our actual sampling process. And so if we want to try to address that, um, first, they might be present right there in the pipeline itself. And so we have to use appropriate probes and make sure our installations are done well. But even then, these can be created by liquids can drop out when we increase the pressure. So during compression, liquids can start to drop out because we reduce the pressure. So when we go back and look at that phase diagram, we're going to show why these things happen. They can be created because we've reduced the temperature. And even when we put in things like a needle valve or a, regula uh, a regulator, when we take a large pressure drop, we get a thing called the Joule-Thompson effect or adiabatic cooling. When you drop the pressure of a gas, it cools. And so you drop the pressure and that again leads to a temperature reduction which can cause us to get condensation. So if we have this hypothetical phase diagram here for hydrocarbons and uh, a water dew point curve, if our process fluid is at this temperature and pressure, whatever those numbers correspond to over here, it's all a gas. As we increase the pressure, we risk hitting the edge of this phase envelope. And as soon as we cross it, now we've got liquid hydrocarbons. And if we increase the pressure on this stream again and got up to here, we'd hit we'd have liquid water. So increasing the pressure is one of the ways that we end up hitting a hydrocarbon or a water dew point in a stream that previously was all gas phase. So this can happen if we have low pressure wellheads, if we're using, looking at casing gas off a of well, and it's at relatively low pressure and we say, well, I'd like to put it into the pipeline. So I'm gonna put a pump in there to compress it, Try to push it into the pipeline, and all of a sudden we get liquid start to drop out. So during compressions, it's possible for us to get to a, a dew point. And again, once that happens, it starts to block off the pipe capacity, can lead to corrosion issues and a number of other things. We can also be in the position, because of the shape of that phase out diagram, you know, it's got this curvature to it, we can be in a position where we're at very high pressures and um, we haven't, we, we don't, we aren't at a dew point, but as we start to lower the pressure of the system, we can come down and cross through the phase envelope. So once we cross through the phase envelope here, we again start to go two-phase. So we're actually super critical when we're above there and we can drop into the point where we actually go two-phase. So because of the shape of this curve, they do things a little bit differently in Europe than we commonly do here. Europe focuses more on dew point and less on concentration. And so in Europe, there's a point on the phase diagram there's a temperature where the belly of that phase diagram sticks out the most. And they say, well, what we're gonna to try to have you do is adjust the pressure in your pipeline so that you're gonna be at the pressure where um, 
Sorry, there's a pressure where the belly sticks out the most. We're going to adjust the pressure of your sample as it goes to the analyzer so that you're always operating around that belly where it's sticking out. So that's going to be the highest dew point temperature you could possibly achieve for this gas. Now, this can happen to us during sampling. Um, you know, many analyzers work at low pressures. So if we lower the pressure, we may run through a dew point there. And so this often happens during our sampling side of things, our sample conditioning. Again, one of the things we're going to talk about the Z gas is it operates at high pressures, at line pressures. So that lets us get a true measure of dew point. It can also happen during transportation in the process, pressure drop along the pipeline. And once natural gas or something like that is coming into the city gates, it's going to be starting to be distributed to homes, there's pressure drop that happens well as well. And so these are common places for us to run into dew point issues. Another common one, you know, if we're running through a pipe, and the pipe's outside, and we're in Canada, we have this risk that it's going to be cold outside. So that pipe gets cooled off. So it may be that in the process, processing facility, we're in the plant, and our temperatures are high enough that everything is gas phase. As it cools off, again, when we cross, as soon as we cross here, we hit a hydrocarbon dew point, cool it off more, we hit a water dew point. And so both of those are problematic for us. And so we're going to see uh, in the operating facility, any place where the gas cools down. So we go through a heat exchanger, we go through a cryo system, we're gonna condense out liquids. If we have warm gas hitting a cool surface, if your gas is warm, we're in a place like Saudi or Qatar, and the natural gas is warm, and we bring it inside of an analyzer building that's air conditioned, as soon as that gas hits cold piece of tubing, we can start to condense out liquids. Wellhead gas coming up from the well is warm, hits cold uh, tree at the top of the well, boom, done. Condensation right there. And of course, like I said, Canada, you know, just ambient temperatures. You can also, we had this issue show up in one of our uh, installations with a client. Great installation, analyzers installed well, heat trace sample line, no heating around the probe. So wintertime, probe gets cold, ice forms in it. Then when it warms up in the daytime, that ice starts to give off water vapor and you read an arbitrarily high dew point. And so anytime we have cold probes or cold samples, even if we're going out to pull a manual sample, we're going to pull a sample in one of these sorts of, you know, sample bomb sort of things. If this has been sitting in the back of my truck and it's cold, it's minus 40 in Canada, and I take it out to the pipeline and try to pull a sample, well, as soon as it hits the cold metal, it starts to condense in the cylinder. So now I got more liquids in the cylinder than I should have, send it to the lab and they go, oh, you got a big dew point problem. Well, it's because my cylinder was so cold, it condensed out extra liquids. So decreasing temperature is one of the other things that causes us to hit a dew point. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, what is the, uh, the width between the water dew point and the hydrocarbon dew point? How would that generally be? I know it would depend on the composition, but- Yeah, so yeah, that's a great question. So it really does depend a lot on what the hydrocarbon composition is. So if I go back to, oops, wrong one. So this graph at the bottom kind of shows that. So you can see there's the water dew point curve, right, in red. And if we we're doing something like an LNG or a very high purity methane, the water dew point, if you started to cool this sample, you can't draw while it's on the zoom wood, it's gonna drive me nuts. If you started to cool the sample, so imagine cooling from the right to the left. As you started to cool the sample, you would hit the water dew point before you hit the LNG hydrocarbon dew point. Uh -huh. If the sample was richer when it's pipeline gas, it's gonna potentially hit the hydrocarbon dew point before the water dew point. So you yep. can't really put a, a number in there. If you're on SPAC, typically in Canada at least, the specification I believe is minus 15 degrees C for the hydrocarbon dew point, 
And most plants run around minus 20 or minus 30 on the hydrocarbon dew point. So pipeline gas in Canada, frequently the water dew point is below the hydrocarbon dew point, but not necessarily by that much, 10 degrees, 15 degrees. Yeah. And below you mean water dew point would be negative 25 or negative? Yes, that's right. So the water dew point might be negative 25 and the hydrocarbon dew point might be negative 15 or even negative 10. Okay, thanks. Yep, my pleasure. So, so there's a bunch of conditions, you know, and so this is a common one in sample systems as well. Hitting cold spots in a sample system, whether it's for a BTU analyzer or a dew point analyzer, we can start to condense out hydrocarbons. As soon as we do that, we change the BTU value and any analyzer that comes after that reads the wrong dew point. And then there's this Joule Thompson effect. And it's that when we go across a regulator, whether it's a process regulator or a sample system regulator, when we drop pressure, natural gas drops by about 0 0.6, 0 0.56 degrees C for every 100 kPa. So that's about 3.9 degrees C. If you want to work in PSI, it's around 4 degrees C for 100 PSI, around 6 degrees C for a megapascal. But every time we cool the temperature, or every time we drop the pressure, the temperature drops as well. So when we go across a process regulator or a sample system regulator or a needle valve, we run the risk of hitting a dew point right there. So this is a common problem a lot of times in our sample systems. If we're using an analyzer that's gonna run at ambient temperatures, like, or ambient, yeah, ambient pressures, I should say. So things like a tunable diode laser system for moisture analysis. You have to drop the pressure before you get into the analyzer. They run at around one bar. Pipeline pressure is around 60 bar. So if I drop 60 bar or 60 atmospheres, I am gonna drop the temperature by 30 degrees C. So even if my pipeline gas isn't at its dew point, when it goes across that regulator, I run the risk of hitting condensation. So, one of the ideal things would be is if we could have an analyzer that started off at a warm temperature, cooled down to a cooler temperature while the whole system's under pressure, and then see if we could monitor the dew points. So the ZGAS device is available. It is a you know, ATAC Zone 1, CSA FM, uh, Class 1, Div 1 package. So sort of for the US slash Canada. Um, we'll place it mostly you still use the division system. Canada has moved a lot over to the zone system now as well. So it's from Canada, it's Div 1 Zone 1, available for European IEC ATEC Zone 1. The ZGAS analyzer is a hydrocarbon water dew point analyzer, simultaneously measuring water and hydrocarbon dew point and operates at the line pressure. So the important thing about that is we don't risk the phase change. We don't try to drop the pressure and risk that Joel Thompson cooling and get a phase change. The other thing, so that's one thing about this, is it reduces our risk of a phase change. And by operating at line pressure, it can tell us the true dew point of the process line. Remember, because we said the dew point temperature is gonna be pressure and temperature dependent or pressure dependent. So if we operate at the same pressure as the pipeline, we're measuring the dew point at the pipeline pressure. It is immune to contaminants. So things we can have, sometimes have other things are gonna condense in our systems like methanol or glycol. Uh, the Z-gas, the way they do the dew point measurement, even if those things start to condense, they don't detect those as a water or a hydrocarbon dew point. Very low maintenance, no moving part, patented technology, um, we're going to talk about Sears. Um, and high accuracy on the dew point, about a half a degree C. So we talk a little bit about how this works. Sears technology. Um, 
Acronyms are always fun, right? Chilled mirror, the C is for chilled mirror, E is for evanescent, talk about evanescent waves, infrared spectroscopy. So IR, chilled mirror, evanescent, infrared spectroscopy. It's a unique technique that was developed by Zegas. Sorab is on here. Um, Sorab is the president of Zegas and uh, was instrumental, of course, in bringing this technology to the world. It allows for a spectroscopic detection of condensation. And this is what separates it, because using the spectroscopy part, we can tell the difference between the water and the hydrocarbon two point. If hey, it was Phil, just sorry a, to interrupt. Yep. I just had a question come through. I just seen it here, story. Um, in regards to the kind of the maintenance side of things, like what, what are the spare par parts and what kind of annual maintenance is actually required? So when we talk a little bit about the sample system, there's usually a coalescing filter in the sample system. So you gotta think that, you know, depending on how clean your stream is, the biggest part of the maintenance is going to be, how often do I have to change my coalescing filter? Physically on the analyzer, if the sample system is working properly and the coalescing filter is making sure that if you have a slug of compressor oil come through, it doesn't get into the analyzer. In principle, the analyzer itself is almost maintenance free. No calibration gases. You don't have to run a zero gas to it regularly. You don't have to run a span gas to it. No moving parts. Probably, you know, Sora will could probably answer better, but you know, we typically see numbers in the five years for a lifetime of things like perhaps a thermoelectric chiller that's a cooling park, five years plus. And so there's really, it's quite low maintenance. It basically runs and runs. The maintenance is like with many analyzers, often on the sample conditioning side. So in that part, it's how often do I have to change my filters up or coalescers up? Perfect. Yeah. And then Phil, there's another one in the chat from Naya. Oh, okay. How about sample lag time since molecules will move slowly at higher pressures? Ah, yeah. So a sample trend. So that's a good question. So, um, so Naya is asking, um, you know, what about how much, how like the lag time for moving the sample over to the analyzer? Because when we keep gas at high pressures. Um, it's compressed when it's in the tubing, but we measure the flow at low pressures at the flow meter. So we go, well, I got a liter a minute of flow, that's lots. Well, when it was at 60 bar, it was compressed by a factor of 60. So it can move quite slowly. So one of the nice things about this technology is that since it is div one zone one, and it's a relatively small package, you know, the analyzer is, I'm not even sure exactly, 15 inches across, the box about, say, 15 inches by 15 inches, um, 45 centimeter, 40 centimeters maybe. So we tend to mount these right out at the process point, keep the sample line really short. And if it's a clean gas like natural gas, run it through eighth inch tubing, electropolished eighth inch tubing so we don't get absorption on the, on the walls. And that lets us still keep that response time uh, for getting to the analyzer quite short. So we will tip, you know, again, we'll be able to do a sample system that responds in less than a minute. Now the analyzer has a cycle too. It's got to cool down, uh, it's got to cool down the mirror to measure the dew points. And so there's some time delay with that as well. So, you know, on the analyzer, we'll often see a few minutes of cycle time. Transport time is fairly fast. So you should figure on probably being able to get a, a reliable update in the order of five minutes. I'm losing my mouse here, there it is. Um, the surface that it interacts with, I'll talk about that a little bit, but it's a crystal. It is a, you know, essentially, if you're to think of like a glass, it is a proprietary and custom crystalline material that doesn't, is, first of all, is, you know, very inert, so it doesn't react to things like H2S and things like that. Um, it doesn't wet up very well, so it doesn't keep liquids on it easily. 
It's not got any porosity to it. And so this helps us that when we heat the crystal back up again, the liquids can come off. So I'm running a little bit slow here, a little bit behind. So I'm going to speed up a little bit here. But feel free to ask questions still. Um, just realize that I tend to sit there and think, oh, God, I want to talk about this forever. But realize not everybody's got a lot of time. Um, so it's based on infrared absorption spectroscopy. And so there's certain wavelengths of light that like to interact with hydrocarbon bonds, HC bonds. And there's certain wavelengths of light that like to interact with OH bonds or water. Right? Think about water and it's oxygen, two hydrogens hanging off of it. And it works off of the idea that when we send a beam of light through something like a crystal that has a high refractive index, it will bounce right off the surface. This is why when we look at a mirror, we see our reflection in the mirror, not, not a mirror, in a window, we see a reflection off the window as well, because not all the light goes right through the window. Some of it bounces off the surface. And if we hit the crystal, if we hit the mirror, or sorry, the window or the crystal at the right angle, something called the Bragg angle, it actually all reflects off the surface because there's a change in refractive index. And what happens though, the only way the light can know that there's a change in refractive index of the surf at the surface is it has to actually go out and turn around and come back in. And we call this the evanescent wave. Evanescence, not the band, um, evanescent is the, uh, a wave that goes outside of the surface and interacts with the fluid around it and then comes back in. So if there's just natural gas there, if there's no liquids there, the wave just goes out, touches the natural gas and comes right back in. If there's liquids there, that wave that got out of the crystal gets to interact with that liquid. So this is where the infrared spectroscopy comes in. We use how the wave, how the light interacts with the liquid to determine what liquid it is. If you're familiar with infrared spectroscopy, you'll hear things called ATR cells, commonly used for li liquids, attenuated total reflectance. Base, it's an it's a evanescent wave based device. So this inert optical sensor, this crystal that doesn't react with anything is put in there at line pressure and the light doesn't even have to go through and touch the gas. It touches whatever that little evanescent wave is, what it sees on the surface. So let's think about what happens then. We take this crystal and we shoot two beams of light through it. Two different colors. One of those colors happens to be, let's say, a color that the hydrocarbons want to react with, interact with. And the other color of light, and there's actually, I'm simplifying this a bit, there's actually more than just two wavelengths being used, but the other light is something that water is going to interact with. So the light bounces across the crystal, makes its way over detectors. We have our natural gas just flowing through the system. Now we start to cool the crystal. So we start out the crystal, uh, we have these two wavelengths of light, two signals at the detector, and we start to cool the crystal down. So this trace right here, the dotted trace, is showing the temperatures. As the crystal cools and the gas is flowing by, initially nothing condenses on the surface because the crystal is warmer than both the water and the hydrocarbon dew point. As the crystal gets cooler, one of these things might condense. So in this case, we're going to see that when hydrocarbons start to show up on the layer, and I've tried to show the hydrocarbons as that little brownish layer on the surface, hydrocarbons drop out on the surface because the crystal is cool. It has just hit the hydrocarbon dew point. So now hydrocarbons drop out of the surface, and the wavelength of light that interacts with hydrocarbons changes its intensity. The light gets absorbed by the hydrocarbons. Oh, sorry, and that you also mentioned, yeah, integrated with a compact probe with a larger tube diameter, the sample's not as clean. Yeah, certainly. Actually, we're gonna do a talk 
in about a month from now, but some of the products we're developing here. And one of them is a fast loop probe that lets you run a fast loop just using the process flow velocity to create differential pressure. So now you can get a sample flowing out to the analyzer and back returning to process uh, at full line pressure with no pumps and no not having to vent anything. And yeah, you can use a large diameter then, which is gonna help you with a dirtier sample for sure. So as the crystal cools in this case, it gets to here and it hits the hydrocarbon dew point temperature. The wavelength of light that's getting uh, interacting with the hydrocarbons drops off in intensity. That's what we're showing right here. The wavelength drops in, in intensity right when we hit this temperature. So we say, well, that temperature corresponds to the hydrocarbon dew point. We continue to cool the crystal. Hydrocarbons are condensing out. And when we hit a certain other temperature, water starts to condense on the surface. The wavelength of light associated with water suddenly drops in intensity. And that tells us we just hit the water dew point. So now the analyzer says, okay, I've just found both dew points. I'm gonna stop cooling, let the crystal warm back up. All the stuff that condensed on the surface evaporates away. And now I'm ready to go again. So the measuring process is cool the crystal, watch both wavelengths. When the hydrocarbon wavelength gets hit, we know you just hit a hydrocarbon dew point. When the water wavelength gets hit, we know you just hit a water dew point. So crystal cools, the light's continuously measured. The evanescent wave is interrogating, asking the surface, anything out there? Hydrocarbons absorb differently than water. And when we see the dew point, when we hit that temperature, suddenly we had an absorption of the light, we know we're at the dew point. This is measuring the actual dew point. This is the same as the Bureau of Mines method. So if you're familiar with the Chandler online analyzer or manual analyzers, it is an automated version of what the Chandler does. Chandler relies on a human being to try to be able to say, that looks like water condensing, that looks like hydrocarbon condensing. The analyzer has, uh, has um, determined both of those. Avishak, um, you're gonna get an email from us and uh, my email address will be in there. My email address, you're gonna get a copy of all the slides and my email address is on there as well. So feel free to either email me or phone me or whatever. So from an applications perspective, common applications are natural gas processing. Simultaneous water and hydrocarbon dew points uh, in pipeline gases allows us to do optimization of dehydration units and cryo separators. So if we're running a, a cryogenic plant, a plant where we're cooling the gas down to try to separate out natural gas liquids, it lets us see, are we actually getting to the dew point we think we're getting? If we put natural gas into caverns for storage, we have a client who, when the pipeline has more capacity than people are using, pumps all the gas into an underground cavern. And then when they need more gas, they can release gas from the cavern. Well, when it's down in the cavern, potentially it's picking up water. So now they wanna know dew points. Natural gas pipelines have tariff enforcements on both water and hydrocarbon dew points. Gas turbines and burners, um, low NOx burners especially, they wanna get this in there for combustion control. If there's risks of hitting the dew point, those drops of liquid contain around 300 times more molecules than a gas at the same volume does. So the liquid consumes a lot of air. So if you're trying to do combustion controls, you wanna have this in place. Liquids that can also cause flame outs and burner, in burners and in turbines. Can over temp heat turbines as well, and damage turbine blades. And in chemical plants, I mean, gas feed quality, both water and hydrocarbon dew point, affect a lot of our catalyst substream. So again, we wanna be able to look at uh, these for processing type applications. The analyzer is available as uh, both a portable unit, which we show down here, kind of suitcase size. So if you wanna do testing at a facility, if you're a, um, uh, a service provider who does testing work for uh, plants to see if, you know, are you guys on spec? The portable is available. 
Fixed installations, especially in Canada, you know, we'll often put them in a cabinet of some kind because we want to protect them against the cold out there. But when we're in temperate regions, you know, you'll see these analyzers just mounted directly outside right at the pipeline. Specification wise, we can cool, I think it's, I think I still have this right, sort of, you may correct me here, it might actually be higher than that, more than 50 degrees C before below ambient. Yeah, we've actually increased that uh, to close to 70 degrees, it, depending on a couple of factors, but uh, yeah. it is closer to 70 degrees now. So if the analyzer is running at 30 degrees C, you can cool down to minus 40, a 70 degrees C differential. Dew point accuracy is typically in that half a degree C range. For Canadians, we have CRNs for up to 2,000 pounds. Systems are pressure tested to 6,000 pounds. RS-485, Ethernet, analog and digital IOs. Uh, a nice user interface, you get to see right on the screen, what's the temperature, what's the pressure, which dew point did I just hit last? Typical insulation from us will look kind of like this. This is in a stainless steel cabinet. Heater at the bottom, deal with those Canadian winters, flow meters for the bypass loop. And again, Nayef, one of the things you were asking about was, you know, speed of response. Well, we do run a bypass flow on the coalescing filters, so we can increase that bypass flow. The analyzer itself doesn't need a lot of flow. Um, does, so the Z-Gas unique abilities are that they can do this simultaneous hydrocarbon and water dew point with a patented technology that is very low maintenance. First principle measurement, it is truly measuring dew point, not calculating a dew point, and gives us a dew point accuracy of about half a degree C. Um, so that's really the summary on the analyzer. There's a couple of things I will just mention because I have to blatantly be a bit of a salesman at times too. And uh, so we have a number of different analytical lines that we work with. Uh, JP3 measurements for infrared spectroscopy, COSA for BTU analyzers and combustion controls, ATOM for total sulfur, Z-gas, of course, these are our, this is the, the star of the day. Um, you know, these are uh, for the water and the hydrocarbon dew point. A couple of different oxygen technologies, alpha, omega, more for uh, glove boxes and things like that, Barbon analytical, an Amatech product for the oxygen and pipelines, VRUs, et cetera. Mark metrics for Raman spectroscopy, XREL for mass spectroscopy, spectra sensors for tunable dial, laser, dial lasers. We manufacture a number of our own products, automated grab samplers, composite samplers, custom sample system components, um, custom probes, custom valving, um, and we do measure a pipeline issue, uh, dithiazine, uh, a trace compound in pipelines where people are using triazine as a, uh, uh, a scrubbing method. And uh, it's a common way of getting rid of H2S, can lead to some problems, so some, we have some analyzers to that. I do like to also mention a little bit about companies and values. And so um, one of the things that, we do as a company, we kind of view us as a STEM type company. We're science, technology, engineering, we have a number of engineers that work here, mathematics. So we support the scientific community, if you like, by being alive and giving people's jobs and by helping our industry. But we also think it's important to give back to community. So every purchase order we take, we put a percentage of it to charity. We allow customers, we talk with customers about which charity of interest is there for you. Common ones we try to support, that we try to support a lot of stuff for kids. So Kids Sport is uh, an organization that gives, uh, uh, helps children be able to have the equipment to play on sports and have opportunity to play sports. And there's a number of art programs for uh, children and aspiring artists. And so whether it's music or uh, dramatic arts or visual arts, um, we like to support art programs as well for kids. So that wraps us up. I always have this slide in here. It just animates through a bunch of the systems integrated systems we put together out in the field. Again, you like to stress, we're a full featured systems integrator. We will build any kind of panel or system that you're interested in. Um, we support all of our products. Again, you know, Jess is part of our service team and we support our, any of our products that we install uh, with factory training and personnel 
and we're on site until it works for him. Um, yeah, thanks. Sorry, I ran about five minutes over here. I guess I got a bit of a five minute later start. I love showing this last picture at the end. Um, there's a lot of our products in this building. Composite samplers. So this is a natural gas liquids. Uh, you have two composite samplers. So these are pipeline measurements every month filling up with a sample. Automated solvent flushes. So a lot of times in sample systems, especially if they're waxy or dirty, the system starts to plug off. You don't always have a technician there who can clean it. So we've automated back flush systems to solvent flush. Uh, as soon as we see, for example, on an optical analyzer, like the JP3 analyzer over here, transmission's going down, the cell's getting dirty, system automatically flushes and clean it. Full PLC controlling automated grab sampling, controlling a control valve. So we have an isokinetic fast loop. Um, again, we love these kinds of projects. So again, thank you very much. Any uh, requests for information, put both mine and Scott's emails in here. Our uh, website is constantly being updated. Jaden, my man up there, is constantly adding more to the website. Um, our web store is uh, in the process of being launched right now, where we'll let you buy sample system components, probes, dithiazine test kits, spare parts for analyzers. Um, and uh, yeah, we try to provide you know as much information as we can. Thanks for everybody. Thanks for coming along.